It's that time of the year where Apple releases things and reviewers talk about them. And this time it's iOS 18 and macOS Sequoia. And we're going to talk about the privacy and security changes. And that's pretty much it. Whether you're a student, a professional, somebody who needs to take notes for classes, or just someone who needs a place to journal safely, Notesnook is a great option for you. Notesnook is open source with end-to-end -end encryption, meaning your notes are yours and only you can have access to them. The app's code is publicly available, so it's all transparent. They have rich text formatting to format your notes using various text styles, headings, lists, and more. And you can even use tags and folders to organize your notes efficiently. If you're somebody who likes to clip content from different websites online, uh, that actually integrates perfectly with Notesnook as they have a clipping tool that integrates with the rest of your notes. One of my personal favorite features is offline access for when you don't have an active internet connection, so you can still use the service when you're offline. If you're somebody who's organized or maybe not so organized, but just need a place to keep your stuff. Notesnook is a great option that not only values your data, but also values your privacy, your security, and being available on every platform so you can always freely move between different operating systems no matter what you're doing on them. Check out Notesnook by visiting the link here on the screen and in the description. It's a great service, it's open source, and it's free to try. So you can go ahead and check it out now to see if it's for you. The first feature is actually something that you might already have found on apps like Signal, ProtonMail, and even some banking applications, and it's the ability to lock out a specific app using something like Face ID. To enable this, you just hold on the app in the app drawer or on your home screen and click Require Face ID. From there on out, you just get asked for your face every time you open the app. Now, I do have three limitations that I'm gonna read off here. The first one is unlike other versions of this feature that you find in Signal and ProtonMail and Tuda and all these apps that are privacy focused, um, they normally allow you to select a time window. Apple's does not have a time window, so it's just gonna prompt you every time you open the app. The second thing is there's no fallback to your device's password. So if you can't use Face ID for whatever reason, um, it's not gonna ask you for a password. It's just not gonna let you in. And on this note, the third limitation is it actually requires Face ID. We have someone in our Signal group that let me know that they actually couldn't even enable the feature unless they enabled Face ID in the first place. So that is a limitation of that feature. Now, my take on this is it's a great tool and I'm happy to see it. I think it's a nice step forward um, because it allows people to add a little bit of security in apps even on an unlocked device. I love that. The only minor criticism I have is I don't really know how helpful it is because realistically any app that had a privacy or security focus already had some implementation of this feature already. And so I don't know what the overlap is of apps that can benefit from this feature that didn't already have this feature. The second feature you might have already seen when you were enabling the last one, and it's instead of just clicking require face ID, you're also going to see hide and require. So the way this works is after you hide an application, you're going to see this folder at the bottom of your app drawer. And then in that folder, it's going to ask for face ID before showing you your hidden apps. Um, there are some limitations with this as well, which is that you will actually completely lose access to notifications, the ability to have calls come through, so you actually get notified for phone calls, and any other alerts. So this really is a, a very, very uh, hidden way for apps to be removed from the general system. The Passwords app. A lot of mixed feelings. Pretty much, if you use Keychain already, which a lot of people do in the Apple ecosystem, I do not like Keychain and I do not recommend it for reasons I'll touch on soon, but essentially now you have a nice fancy app to access all of your Keychain data, and that is Passwords now. So this has been released for iOS, macOS, and funny enough, Windows. Uh, but not Android and not Linux. So Apple acknowledged that Windows is a real operating system and they didn't acknowledge Android, even though Apple Music is on Android. So Apple is just really interesting when they select what kind of operating systems they support. Anyway, the nice thing about this is you actually have a dedicated place to view your passwords, which is really cool. I feel like a lot of people who use Keychain don't even know they can access their Keychain passwords in their settings. They kind of just rely on autofill to do everything for them. Now, this doesn't have anywhere near as many settings, features, or the functionality that you're looking for. Most people look watching this at least in a regular password manager. So if you want a proper password manager, probably take a look at our other password manager suggestions that are on our website and then the content that we make, because not only do those have a lot more features, but they're probably going to be a little bit better and more robust, and they allow you to use them on different operating systems. 
Who would want that, right? On the bright side, I think for people who are already in Apple's walled garden, have no plans of leaving, and are using Keychain anyway, this is actually a nice improvement for Keychain users. This one's really minor. Uh, they've already released the ability to pretty much grant all contacts to an application. You can say yes or no, so certain apps can have your contacts and some apps don't. Now it's a little bit more granular. You can actually select uh, which contacts you wanna share on a per app basis. If you're wondering why you might wanna do this, well, it's so that apps can't just get your entire address book, which is something that Facebook notoriously uses for uh, trying to figure out all of your social networks. Let's say a friend of yours uses Telegram or WhatsApp and they're one of like five people who use that app and you don't wanna share your entire address book with that app, then you can just share you know, a few people and still be able to save those contacts into your address book, but they're just one of a few people who are, who are put down. Um, now, one thing I don't like about this feature is you have to select each contact for every specific app. So let's say you have 10 people who you consistently um, are going to add as a contact you wanna share with different applications. You have to add those 10 people manually each time. So I wish there was some way to add groups or like a bucket of like family members or close friends so that way you can just share um, like close friend contacts with certain applications. But cool feature nonetheless. Over on macOS Sequoia, the main feature here that really was exciting for me was iPhone mirroring. This is not a privacy feature per se, but we're gonna talk about the privacy benefits that can come from it. So not too long ago, we actually covered how there are some signal desktop vulnerabilities slash security issues. And just in general, mobile operating systems have really robust sandboxing and security policies that are a little bit harder to find and emulate on desktop operating systems. So this, as you can imagine, enables some extra workflows because what this does is it mirrors your iPhone exactly as it is onto your Mac. So, someone like Jonah, for example, who hates the Signal desktop client, actually doesn't need the Signal desktop client to still get Signal messages. Because now you just open the iPhone from your MacBook. And not only does that mean that your messages don't have to be synced to the Mac, so that when you open the desktop client, it syncs every single time, but it also means you don't have to trust the security of Signal's desktop program. Signal's kind of a bad example because these are a little bit more nitpicky security issues that while still important, aren't gonna impact a lot of people. Where I think this is more important is with something like TOTP, those six digit codes that you use for 2FA. The best case scenario is those are on one device that are offline. But as many people have experience, it's very inconvenient because what if you're trying to log into an account on your computer and it uses TOTP, but your phone's in the other room. Now you gotta get up, grab your phone and come back. Or you sync over a service and not every service uses end-to-end -end encryption. It can avoid those situations which might improve your privacy or security. I have some complaints with this feature. It's not perfect, but I'm leaving that in the blog rather than talking about it here in the video, which I'm trying to keep a little more focused on privacy and security. Um, the next change on macOS Sequoia is the passwords app that I talked about it is also here on macOS Sequoia and my thoughts on it and the only, there's no differences. So everything that I talked about in the iOS section is the same here on the Mac OS section. Okay, this one's a little nerdier and it has to do with Gatekeeper. So if you've ever downloaded an app that wasn't signed properly and then Mac OS goes, oh, this, isn't, this might not be a dangerous app, and then it forces you to go into the system settings, go into privacy and security, and then manually allow a specific program to open, I didn't know this actually, so nothing changes for me, but apparently you can actually bypass all this nonsense by just right clicking on the app before you open it and clicking open app <laughs> instead of just double clicking the application. Um, very minor, but if you knew about this workaround and you were using that workaround often, that workaround no longer exists. So everybody now, if something is flagged by Gatekeeper, you're going to have to open system settings. I didn't know about this. I don't know how many people knew about this, but you can't do it anymore if you did know about it. Uh, the next thing that's getting a lot of attention online. Um, it's probably the most popular security feature for all of the wrong reasons, and it's the notifications on macOS Sequoia. So for screen recording now, you're gonna get a monthly notification that an app is able to access your screen. There's already a lot of takes on this online. Even as somebody who almost always wants more security out of their operating system, if I explicitly grant a program permission to record my screen, I don't know what being notified about it monthly is going to do. 
There's also a local networks permission that's also popping up for people as well. So just keep in mind that there's a lot more pop-ups going on in macOS Sequoia, so much so that people are kind of comparing it to Vista. So I don't know, I'll let you all leave your thoughts below on what you think about that because it's not something I'm a fan of, but yeah, let me know. The last feature on macOS Sequoia is Mac address randomization. So what this is going to do, um, when you connect to a network, you are going to share with your network your Mac address. It has nothing to do with MacBooks. Every device does this, including your phones. And now that can be somewhat randomized. This feature is actually really weird, and it's one of the weirdest features because I can't really find much information on it as well as how it works. So what you do is you connect to a network, you go into the information of the network, and then you're going to see that you can choose either fixed or rotating Mac address. Fixed is what it sounds like. You're gonna have the same MAC address and nothing changes. Rotating will consistently change the MAC address on that network. What is unclear is it doesn't seem like you can set a global default as far as I know. So it seems like every time you connect to a new network, you're going to use the same MAC address unless every network by default gets a different MAC address and I don't understand how um, MacBooks slash Mac OS uh, randomizes MAC addresses. So if someone can help fill me in on this feature, that would be very helpful. The research I'm doing is kind of leading down nowhere at the moment, but it does seem like no matter what, what I would recommend, no matter how this feature works, is on a trusted network, you wanna keep this fixed, and on untrusted networks, you wanna use rotating. No matter what, it seems like every two weeks, it's going to rotate your MAC address. I'm just unclear on what MAC address is used when you initially connect to each network from macOS. So there definitely were some nice changes, um, but nothing grand, nothing fantastic, but also nothing bad. I don't think anything moved um, the ecosystem in a negative direction. With that said, some things that I really wished that I got to see that just didn't happen, and hopefully Apple can do those in the future for people that are in the Apple ecosystem. The first thing is lockdown mode on macOS still cannot be excluded for Safari progressive web apps. So remember those super fancy web apps that Safari released that everyone was really excited for, myself included? Yeah, if you have lockdown mode, you can't have a web app in Safari without lockdown mode enabled, which breaks a lot of web apps. I also wish that Apple would just commit to more damn platforms. Um, I don't understand why they would release, I almost understand them not releasing the path, like Keychain on Windows, more than them releasing this new Passwords app, which is Keychain in a fancy app. And then they choose to release it on Windows but not every other operating system out there. Um, I would love to see some improvements to the iPhone mirroring to Mac OS. Again, a lot of my complaints for that are in the blog post that I'll leave down below. Um, and then a big elephant in the room that Apple just doesn't want to address is the VPN leakage issue on iOS. It's just really bad. Um, for those who aren't aware, I, I just really wouldn't trust iOS um, in any capacity to keep your IP address private. Now, Android has issues too, right? Like the Android kill switch thing, isn't perfect, has some issues, but where it leaks your IP address is a lot more niche and a lot less uh, common than what iOS does, which is just randomly just not connecting to a VPN, even though you're supposed to be connected to a VPN all the time. Finally, kind of in the same vein as the iPhone mirroring not really being a privacy feature per se, um, I kind of feel like work profiles slash user accounts that you see on Android um, need to come to iOS. I think that's going to get rid of the need for this hidden apps feature, which seems a little weird and really speaks to how Apple doesn't allow people to compartmentalize use cases on their phone. And the profiles functionality is really robust on iOS, but you still can't install two of the same app. You can't have two different signal apps on your phone. You can't have two different Apple accounts on your phone. It's only one phone for one person and the user accounts functionality that you see on some Android devices would really resolve this kind of issue where you can put some apps in a different user account that have a different password, um, and you can even use work profiles to have two versions of the same app, and you can turn off the work profile when you're not using it. Really cool features that don't really do anything for privacy and security by itself, but they enable some crazy cool workflows that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do on an iOS device. With that said, not bad updates, just nothing great, but I hope that you learned something, and if you're on the iOS and macOS ecosystem, definitely leave your thoughts below on any of these things. Leave a like, 
share this video. Check out the blog version of this down below as well. There's some more fine details in there. And if you like this kind of content, be a patron or a tech lorian now on our forum because now we have a way for you to support us recurring and still join our signal group and you get benefits to our exclusive forum community. So yeah, there's a lot of good stuff there and we control it. So go ahead and check out our new tech lorian uh, little spiel um, on the forum side of things. And then we still have Patreon. We have XMR chat now as well. And we're trying to find some new ways uh, for you all to support what we're doing back here. I also wanna give a major shout out to Notesnook. We couldn't do it with our sponsors and they're kicking butt over there. And I love what they're doing. If you wanna learn more about Apple's lockdown mode, check out this video I made on them right here. It's a great video to kind of explain to you whether or not you should use lockdown mode and what to expect when you enable it. I'll see you in that video and I'll see you next time on TechLore.